I want to begin this lecture by trying to define, or at least attack from a number of angles, a couple of words and concepts that Machiavelli uses where the modern English equivalent, as you'll find in any translation, just doesn't fully tell us what Machiavelli has in mind. And one of those terms is the Italian word virtù, which is almost always translated as virtue. And the other is the Italian word fortuna, which we translate, of course, as fortune. And Dante, Dante, wrong guy, Machiavelli. That was another course. Machiavelli uses both of these terms a great deal. And what I want to argue is he's really giving us something of a new definition of virtù. And with regard to fortune, he is really sort of passing over what happened to that concept in the Middle Ages and going back to a more classical definition of it. And therefore, it's worth pausing because in all of Machiavelli's works, he uses both of these words a great deal. When we say somebody practices virtue, what we tend to mean is they're kind and gentle and sweet and loving and prudent and temperate and all the other things. But virtu, we need to appreciate, comes from the word for man. That is to say, vir or weir in classical Latin. And therefore, it is a word that implies a certain manliness. But more than that, what Machiavelli wants to argue is that virtu is the way you practice statecraft successfully. It's nice if in practicing statecraft successfully, in practicing virtu, it's nice if you are nice and gentle and kind and loving, and there may be situations where that is sufficient and fine. Machiavelli is not against those things. But what Machiavelli argues is one needs to be somewhat aggressive and manly in order to maintain power in most situations. And that sometimes means cheating, lying, deceiving, carrying out acts of cruelty. Those can be defined by Machiavelli as virtu. Because, after all, those are things that keep states stable. And I think Machiavelli would probably in some ways agree with what King Creon says in Antigone's play, in Sophocles' play, Antigone. And that is that chaos, anarchy, is the worst of all things. Nobody has any rights. No human relations can exist when there is chaos. And therefore, to bring about and keep order is indeed to practice virtue as Machiavelli understands the word. Now, like many authors, he doesn't always use the word virtu to mean exactly the same thing. Sometimes when he uses the word, it seems to mean something traditional something like a dictionary definition that we would have today. But many other times he uses it in this new sense. And it's important when reading The Prince to have this in mind. Because usually from the context one can determine whether he's using this word in a traditional way or whether he's applying a somewhat new definition. So be aware that every time you hear me say the word virtue, or if you read the prince in English, you see the word virtue, or if you read it in Italian, you see the word virtu, keep in mind one needs to ponder a little bit exactly how Machiavelli is using that word. The second term is fortune or fortuna in Italian. In ancient times, it was said that fortune is like a woman. And therefore, to some extent, this is not me now, this is classical authors, keep in mind, that some, in some way then, fortune can be controlled and its effects can be influenced. We can do things to affect fortune. 
However, as Christianity came into the world as a dominant religion in the West, the term fortune came to change. For example, Dante has the image, and he doesn't create it, but he's the most famous user of it, perhaps, of the wheel of fortune. And what Dante says is fortune spins the wheel, and the wheel determines good and bad with regard to material possessions. And we really have no control over the wheel which is constantly spinning. In other words, fortune has come to mean something like fate, something we endure, but something over which we have no control. Machiavelli is going to go back to a more classical definition of fortune. And therefore, there are certain things that happen over which we have no control. He will use the very famous image at the end of the book, fortune is like a river. We'll talk about it more then, but basically fortune, well, there are floods. We can't stop the rains from coming. We can't stop the snow from melting in the Apennines and filling the rivers. But we can be prepared for fortune. We can build levees and dikes and dams and whatever. And so there's an interplay between things outside our control and things that we can modify the effects of. That Those are both parts of the idea of fortune. Fortune does not mean fate for Machiavelli. And so I'm going to be using both of those words, beginning with some of the analysis in this lecture and throughout our discussions of Machiavelli. And I simply want to be aware of the issues of these two very important words. Now, let me suggest that Machiavelli says directly to his readers, you know what you need to do? What you need to do is study history. You need to see what virtu consists of, how successful rulers have operated. You need to see how people have dealt with fortune. Again, it doesn't matter in a sense if everything is fated, because then you don't make any choices. But if you believe in his definition of fortune, then what you need to do is see how people have prepared for it and responded to certain acts over which they had no control. Everything from natural disasters to an unexpected death to whatever it might be. And if virtu has to do with keeping control and keeping power and keeping order, then obviously what it consists of in any particular situation is going to be different from another situation because of the uniqueness of circumstances. So if we believe in his definition of fortune, if we believe in his definition of virtue, we need to do a lot of serious study, he says. Let me take a look at some of the great conquerors of all time. And by the way, they include a much broader list than you might expect. Of course, he would mention a Roman like Romulus or a Greek like Theseus, these sort of semi-legendary figures that come out of classical antiquity. But among the great conquerors, he also includes Moses. He's read his Exodus, as well as his Livy, as well as his Greek history. And he says that fortune gave them the opportunity to create new principalities. Fortune gave them the opportunity. Fortune didn't make it succeed. Fortune didn't determine the outcome. What fortune does for these guys, and they are guys, of course, is to give them certain opportunities. And it's important to take a look at those opportunities. Now, once you've been given the opportunity to conquer a new territory, the question is, what do you do? How do you establish new political institutions? Okay, you've been given the opportunity. You've taken advantage of the opportunity. And now, what do you do? Well, let's start with this. There are always people who prospered under the old rule who will oppose any new rule. If you're very close to the top in a society and somebody new comes into rule, you recognize that you're probably going to descend in terms of power or whatever it might be. Secondly, even those who didn't particularly prosper under the old realm are going to be suspicious of the new realm. It isn't to them 
clear or necessary that they will be lifted up or the people above them will be brought low. The point, of course, that Machiavelli makes is this is hard. It's a lot easier to fail than succeed, even if fortune, something over which, some particular thing over which you had no control or very little control, gives you an opportunity. That isn't enough. You can't say, gosh, you know, God opened the Red Sea for me to lead these people and form a new society. That isn't enough. Without some sort of opportunity, you can't do it. But opportunity doesn't equal success. And so Machiavelli says, if you've been, in a sense, blessed by fortune, you then need to practice virtue. You need to go out and be successful by your own virtue. You must be willing and able to use force. This is not always nice. You've got to be willing to use force. You've got to be willing to be tough. One of the most famous phrases out of the many famous phrases in The Prince is Machiavelli saying that armed prophets succeed, Moses would be a good example, while unarmed prophets fail. Here's somebody who has a, a, an opportunity and a vision of a new society. You need to do that and be armed. And his great example of an unarmed prophet is Girolamo Savonarola. Talked about him in the previous lectures. This is, after all, the Dominican preacher who was a very important leader in Florence. He was a mesmerizing speaker. He would preach in the cathedral. He would organize, especially young men, to sort of carry out moral reform. But ultimately, he depended only on his own ability to persuade and inspire. There was nothing there to support his movement. And of course, sooner or later, it went wrong. And as we know, within four years of Savonarola really taking the leadership in the founding of the New Republic following the expulsion of Piero de' Medici in 1494, Savonarola was executed in the main square in Florence. In fact, one of the newest and finest biographies of Savonarola, the title is The Unarmed Prophet. It's become a phrase that stuck to Savonarola. Again, I want to point out Machiavelli had a great deal of respect for Savonarola. He was brilliant in what he did, but it wasn't enough. He was not able ultimately to bring his vision, his idea of this new society to bear because he didn't have the wherewithal to do it. Being a great speaker isn't enough. There's a difference, he says, between armed and unarmed prophet. And by prophet here, there's no religious connotation. Prophet means somebody, in a sense, with a vision of a new society, a new structure. And Machiavelli contrasts that with a figure who's a fairly minor figure for us today, unless you're really a classical historian, a guy named Hiero of Syracuse. And he tells the story of Hiero, Syracuse in southern Italy, in Sicily. He tells the story of Hiero and how Hiero had a vision to take over, and how he executed that vision armed with military support, and that Hiero, whatever you think of his vision, Hiero was successful, while ultimately Savonarola wasn't. So it's an interesting contrast that Machiavelli gives between, and he does this so often, an ancient example and a modern example. Chapter 7 there are 26 chapters in The Prince. Chapter 7 is, to me, a particularly important one because here Machiavelli pauses, it seems, to tell stories of a man whom he knew personally and a man whom he deeply respected, but a man who ultimately failed. This is Cesare Borgia. Cesare Borgia was the son of Pope Alexander VI, member of the Borgia family. And if you recall, I mentioned this briefly earlier in a previous lecture. One of the main goals of the pontificate of Alexander VI was to provide a territory for his son to rule forever, ideally, and a husband for his daughter, Lucretia Borgia. 
Well, of course, there's been a lot more ink spilled over Lucretia Borgia than there has been Cesare. But Machiavelli spelled, spilled his ink over Cesare Borgia. And he says, let me take a look at this guy because he conquered an area of Italy. He was a new prince. He was not hereditary. He conquered an area that's called the Romagna. Now, today, if you look at a map of Italy and you see it divided into the 20 political regions of Italy, like Tuscany and Lombardy and whatever, one of those regions is called Emilia Romagna. The capital of Emilia Romagna is Bologna. It was north of Florence. This is the more eastern part of Emilia Romagna, much of it very hilly, very difficult territory to hold, and not a territory dominated by major cities. Okay, we sometimes think of Italy as very, very urban. The Romagna is not a particularly urban part of Italy. And so Cesare Borgia goes to carve out this territory for himself. Now, he has if you will, fortune. For one thing, daddy is pope. And daddy can get him some troops. And daddy does get him some troops. He gets him some French troops. And so Cesare is able to take over the Romagna, not actually grabbing it by any great virtu of his own, but largely because there was opportunity. Dad was Pope. French troops were available to help him. And so the question is, what do you do with it? I've got the Romagna. Now what? Well, let me fast forward to the end. Cesare dies a defeated man. And yet many people talk about Cesare Borgia as the hero of Machiavelli. Let me just point out parenthetically, because if you read things about Machiavelli, you need to know that Cesare Borgia's name is that, but he also has a title he's sometimes referred to as Duke Valentine or Valentino. Same guy. Okay, they're all the same guy, Cesare Borgia. I'm going to call him Cesare Borgia. That is, after all, his given name. So it seems odd that Machiavelli's hero is a guy who ended up defeated. But Machiavelli looks at him, looks at his career, knew him personally, and said, this guy did almost everything right. He made one big mistake at the end that cost him everything, and Machiavelli doesn't try to cover that up. Cesare Borgia, if he is Machiavelli's hero, is a flawed hero, and a big flawed hero. But what Machiavelli sees is Cesare got the Romagna by essentially good fortune, and then by the practice of virtu, he took control. He set up new institutions. And he brought order to the Romagna. No mean feat, as it turns out. Perhaps more than anything else, Machiavelli looks at Cesare Borgia and says, he realized that those French troops were not sufficient. Because when you use somebody else's troops, as he did to conquer the Romagna, you're in the debt of, and some ways under the control of, the person supplying the troops, who after all can always unsupply them. And so, he says, Cesare Borgia recognized that what he needed to do is build his own army, an army of his own troops, who were loyal to him, not lent to him as the French troops were. This is unusual in Machiavelli's day because most of the wars that were fought in Italy in Machiavelli's day were fought with mercenary troops, sometimes foreign, sometimes Italian, but mercenary troops. The papacy had Swiss troops. We still see the Swiss guards in the Vatican and so on. And as I pointed out in my biographical lecture of Machiavelli, Machiavelli, as an official of the Florentine Republic, tried to make Florence less dependent on mercenaries and build some sort of force from the men in the Florentine city-state, primarily in the countryside. 
And so Machiavelli sees as part of the virtu of Cesare Borgia that he did not rest on the fact that Lent troops conquered the Romagna for him. Again, that's the opportunity. That's the fortuna part. It's virtu that will keep that territory. Now, one of the problems with the Romagna was it was a mess. In particular, it was disordered. It's a hard place to police. Again, it's hilly, and it hadn't had strong government for a while. And so there was theft and brigandage and all the rest that you associate with a place that doesn't really have an effective government. How does Cesare Borgia make the Romagna his? You bring, if I may use a phrase, law and order. People want security. People want to be safe. Farmers want to take their goods from their farm to the market. People want to travel for commerce or, for that matter, on religious pilgrimage. And they don't want to be mugged when they get outside the walls of their city. And so Cesare Borgia recognized the essential quality of bringing order. How does he do it? He used as his employee, if you will, a Spaniard, whom we know as Ramiro de Orco. And Ramiro de Orco was tough. He imposed law and order we would say today without a lot of niceties. We would say today without being very attentive to people's civil rights or due process. Now these are terms I'm introducing from a later time, but this is a guy who played tough. You find somebody who's a thief, you don't spend a long time with the trial, you lop the head off. This is tough stuff. We know that creating order out of chaos is tough business. And Ramiro was one tough guy. And you always offend certain people when you act that way, even if the result is the place is getting a little bit more peaceable. There are always people who say, I don't want to see body parts scattered around that Ray Miro has chopped off of a thief or whatever. And after all, that thief is somebody's son or he's somebody's father. You always offend people. And again, Ray Miro de Orco was tough. Machiavelli says that Cesare knew that when he appointed him. And clearly Cesare knew what he was doing and thought that was okay because the goal is order and security and stability, which also, of course, will strengthen Cesare as the ruler of the Romagna. And then Cesare made what is regarded by Machiavelli as one of the brilliant moves. One day in the city of Cesena, which is in the Romagna, people awoke and came to the main square and there was Ramiro de Orco. Half of him in this part of the square and half of him in that part of the square. He had been sawed in half and he was laid out in two pieces. Now, we would say, pretty cruel. After all, this guy was hired to do a job. He did it and clearly he did it with the consent of the person who hired him, Cesare Borgia. But think what this did. First of all, it says, hmm, Cesare is a pretty tough guy himself. He's in charge. But more than that, it said, Ramiro sort of went over the line and Cesare didn't let him get by with that. And therefore, in a sense, we come to like Cesare more. Because when he saw one of his own officials being sort of too mean and too tough, he said, by cutting him in half, I'm not going to put up with that. 
Now, again, we can look at Cesare as one of the great hypocrites of all time. He knows what this guy's doing. He approves of it. And now that he sees it's in his interest to do so, he saws him in half as a way of saying, I'm on your side. I'm a good guy. I have limits to what I will tolerate in terms of reaching the goal of order and stability. He gets the both, best of both worlds here. Cesare does. Machiavelli sees this as brilliant. Because on the one hand, Cesare has gotten some law and order in the Romagna, and he's gained in popularity and respect with the citizenry for sawing this guy into two pieces. By the way, notice, he doesn't kidnap him. He doesn't hang him out in the woods. He saws him in half and props him up in the main square. I mean, we just have to picture this visually. You come into town to buy your melon to go with today's prosciutto in the market, and there's this guy on both halves of the piazza. It's pretty dramatic. Pretty public. Word spreads fast. You don't need newspapers when you do something that dramatic. Word spreads very fast. And everybody knew what it meant. Everybody knew who was responsible for slicing Ramiro de Orco in half. It was Cesare Borgia. And so Cesare Borgia becomes not the hero to Machiavelli. I don't think that's the right word. But he does become a model of virtu somebody who has achieved something through fortune and now says, I'm going to make it work and I've got to figure out how to do it in the particular situation of the lawlessness of the Romagna. And Cesare had plans to expand his territory beyond the Romagna into Tuscany, which is after all where Florence is. But Cesare didn't do that. One of the other plans of Cesare was to make sure that when daddy died, he could name, ideally, the next pope, meaning he had enough cardinals in his pocket that he could choose the next pope. Well, he never got to that point. But he did have enough cardinals in his pocket that he could veto any candidate for pope. So he didn't have the control he'd hoped to get over the College of Cardinals, but he had enough to have a veto power because it takes two-thirds of the cardinals to elect a pope, then as now. Well, what happened was Alexander died, that is say Alexander VI, Cesare's father, died unexpectedly. And he died at a time when Cesare was very ill. And this was a bad combination. In fact, a pope was elected who only lived for about a month, Pius III, and then they come back to another conclave. We all remember that happening in 1978 when John Paul I died after about a 30-day pontificate. And Cesare Borgia allowed Pope Julius II to be elected. This, Machiavelli said, was his mistake. Julius was a military man, mean-spirited. Go watch the movie The Agony and the Ecstasy. He's the guy that commissioned Michelangelo to paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel where he's always yelling at Michelangelo. He really wasn't a very nice man. Mean, warlike, military, led troops in battle himself. Cesare could have gotten those cardinals who were in his pocket to veto the election of Julius, but he didn't. And that was his undoing. And as a result, he made one fatal mistake, and that did in everything Cesare had so brilliantly through the practice of his virtu after the opportunity given him by fortune had carried out. And so Cesare is an interesting lesson. And again, Machiavelli saw this up close and personal. He was actually with Cesare Borgia on a diplomatic mission for Florence at the time Alexander VI died. So Machiavelli saw all this up front up close, despite the fact that it all ended in tragedy with Julius II becoming Pope and really sort of putting an end to the rule of Cesare over the Romagna, Machiavelli still looks at Cesare as a model of virtu, not a flawless model, but a model. The way he tried to get control of the College of Cardinals, the way he brought in his own troops, the way he used cruelty well, 
a term Machiavelli will use, cruelty well, in his manipulation of and the death of Ramiro de Orco. And so in this dramatic portrait of this man, Cesare Borgia, in only a very few pages in chapter 7, we have one of the most dramatic sets of lessons that Machiavelli teaches us in a book full of lessons.